Well, first of all, I'm still stunned by the fact that I'm standing here in the company of other Eugene serving award winners. I thank all of you for this. If all you do to support community newspapers across the nation and around the world. And thank you, Richard, for your introduction. I did have the opportunity to spend a wonderful day with Richard last fall when he visited our newspaper offices down in Jefferson, Georgia. And I was thrilled to finally meet the man face to face I had admired from a distance for so many years. But Richard, I have a confession to make. As all of you know, one of Richard's claims to fame was his expose about the giant newspaper conglomerate Gannett and its unethical and illegal business practices. For many years, Gannett made a systematic effort in its markets of trying to put small weekly newspapers out of business. Through his exposés and book, Richard ripped the mask off of Gannett. One of the main Gannett villains that Richard exposed was a man named Buddy Hayden, a Gannett publisher in Salem, Oregon, who directed the assassination of a small weekly paper in the late 1970s. <coughs> Richard Mill. But as the late Paul Harvey would say, here's the rest of the story. <laughs> Richard, what you probably didn't know when you visited my office in Georgia last fall, there was a ghost in the room. Once occupying that office in the early 1960s as publisher and editor was none other than Buddy Hayden. In fact, the Herald was Hayden's first stint as a newspaper publisher. It's where he cut his teeth in the newspaper before moving on to publications and eventually up to Gannett. And it really is a small world. Buddy Hayden did get something of a comeuppance for his attack on weekly newspapers when two daily newspapers later failed under his watch. And when Hayden died in 2002, he was selling health food supplements in California. And I suppose there's some kind of karma in that somewhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never met Gene Serby. But while I did not know him, I like what I know about him. He was a fighter. He pulled no punches. His pen really was his sword. Serby is quoted as once saying, each week I look around and see what person with $2 million is engaged in a selfish action. Then I pick up a brick and throw it through his window. <laughs> Serby was dedicated to the tenacious and unrelenting pursuit to hold those in power accountable. His aggressive spirit echoes one of the dictates that I've long tried to follow. It's an old Chinese proverb that says, the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their right name. Isn't that our mission as editors? To call things by their right name? I think we need to remind ourselves every week to do that. To seek truth and accuracy. We need to hold those in power accountable. And when changes are needed in our communities, we should say so forcefully and with clarity. Change does not happen from the center. It happens from the margins. We won't affect change with flaccid editorials and weak news coverage that doesn't offend anyone. Serby once said that a newspaper is supposed to be controversial, disagreeable, disruptive, unpleasant, and unfriendly to concentrated power. In other words, we need to call things by their right name. And if sometimes we need to throw a brick to bring attention to a problem, let's do what Serby did and throw it hard enough to break the damn wind. Let's throw it hard enough to wake up the whole town. Words, our words, can have power if we use them with clarity and without fear. Now, not every editor agrees with that approach. I have colleagues around the country who tell me they'd rather be community builders than community critics. But our job is to build communities. We're not the architects of the house, nor the bricklayer, nor the painter, nor the landscaper. We're the ones standing in the street, riding at the houses, waiting, or it's leaking, or it's ugly. It's up to others to short the foundations, patch the roof, and repaint. I have yet to see a community that doesn't need questions asked, or where public officials don't need to be held accountable. Even good people make bad public policy decisions. Even good people are tempted by unchecked power. If not us, then who in our communities 
will hold those in power accountable. Now, aggressive and compassionate approach to news doesn't endear us to many people in our small towns. I guess if we wanted to be loved, we would have been nurses or nuns or something else. <laughs> but all of us chose to be weekly newspaper editors instead. Now, my brother and I were lucky, as Richard alluded, to have grown up in a family newspaper. In fact, this month marks 50 years since our parents sold everything they had to buy a failing little weekly in Northeast Georgia. They subsisted mostly on a dream. It's a dream my brother and I came to share, and we try to carry on today. Having grown up in a family newspaper, the defining moment of my career happened when I was a kid. In 1967, an organized crime ring in our town <clears throat> put six sticks of dynamite in a car and blew up our district attorney. Although I was young, that event shook me to the core. His kids were my friends. That event dominated our newspaper for years as its fallout rained down our county. It is a touchstone of my career and became part of my editorial DNA. That murder happened because fear was pervasive in our town. Few had the courage to call things by their right name. Everybody knew what was going on. Dixie Mafia crime was rampant in our county. But still silence and fear ruled and the corruption got worse. People can die when truth lies unspoken. Forty years after that tragedy, we did a series of investigative stories that led to the arrest and prison sentence of an official who had been stealing public money for personal use. The irony was that corrupt public official was the district attorney who in 2007 held the very same office, sat in the very same chair as the district attorney who had been murdered in 1967. <clears throat> Isn't it funny? how strands of old stories turn up again years and even decades later. We don't really publish 52 or maybe a few more individual newspapers a year. Rather, we are weaving an ongoing narrative about life in our communities. It's a narrative that is a circle of triumph and tragedy, of folly and fame, of love and loss. What an opportunity we have as editors to be at the center of that circle. Like many of you, our newspaper has been at the center of dozens of editorial brawls of local officials. <clears throat> Among other things, we've argued for new traffic lights to stop people from dying, fought industries that polluted our air and our streams, opposed elaborate public scams and the politicians who endorsed them, fought corporate welfare, slapped police traps as being nothing more than tax collection at gunpoint, editorially blistered numerous commissions and councils and school boards for wasting tax money on frivolous and e ecocentric projects. And when our local public officials make particularly absurd comments, we have no hesitation about mocking or lampooning them on our editorial page. Putting an editorial needle into the inflated ego of a puffed up public official is always a pleasure. I like to think of it as pricking the pricks. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most fun editorial fights we had was a little town government steeped in petty corruption by the family that ran it. One Sunday I got a tip the mayor was holding an illegal council meeting in his house to secretly interview candidates for police chief. I went and knocked on the door. Mr. Mayor, I said, looks like you're having an illegal meeting here. Seems you think you can do whatever you want to in this town. I'm the mayor, and I'll do whatever the hell I want to do, he roared. I'll do whatever the hell I want to do, in big, bold quotes. It was the lead head in the next issue of the Jackson Herald. This said more about what was really going on in that little town than dozens of editorials I had previously written about it. If you call things by the right name long enough, sometimes the corrupt will even admit it. Like many of you, I've been fortunate to have traveled across this nation and around the world in pursuit of new stories over the years. 
In 1985, I spent three weeks traversing across the Soviet Union, seeing its historical sites, listening to its inane government propaganda, and along the way, crashing a Russian wedding to drink vodka with a bride and groom. <laughs> but I also witnessed the devastating effects of 70 years of fear and censorship and economic hardships had had on its people. Six years later, in 1991, I walked around Red Square in Moscow just a few days before the Soviet Union imploded. It was a downfall that was inevitable of what I had seen there in 1985. I was a child of the Cold War, and being in Russia as it ended was astonishing. And there were some other adventures too. I covered war refugees in Central America, bribed a pilot in Moscow to give me a ride on a plane of smuggled contraband, got ragingly drunk with a rebel leader who had just helped overthrow his country's president, who was a tyrant I had interviewed just a few months earlier. And along the way, I met astronauts and artists and actors, presidents and peasants, despots and zealots. I danced in the White House, stood on the speaker's balcony of the U.S. Capitol, and once got thrown out of the U.S. Senate. <laughs> and the sights I saw and experiences I had will never leave me. I saw wildlife in the Galapagos Islands, slept in a hammock in the Amazon jungle, rode a camel in Cairo, floated on the Thames, the same, the Amazon, and the Nile, hitchhiked in the Andes, stood on the plains of the Serengeti and the plains of Abraham, meandered among the rabble of Occupy Wall Street, felt the ghost of Gettysburg while walking its fields under a full moon, and in hundreds of places all over the world, chased the fading out and glow for one last photo before darkness. Aren't we lucky? to see and experience the world, both near and far, through the prism of being a newspaper editor. I believe my brother and I were also lucky to have worked in a small town paper during the golden age of growth and innovation. As kids, we developed film in a dark room and set headlines and add copy and hot type on an old Lebo and poured pigs to a line type. Today, we push a few buttons on a computer and the darn ads and pages almost create themselves. How amazing it's been to have worked in this era of so much innovation and change in our industry. But it's an era that may be ending. The massive economic upheavals happening to our traditional business model are very, very troubling. And I wonder, if community newspapers don't survive, who will be left to call things by their right name in our towns? Who will be left to hold public officials accountable? I want to close with three brief anecdotes. Last year I got a letter from a man who had heard a rumor that I was ill and might die soon. We had written about a minor incident at his house several years ago and he was still very angry. May God's will be done, he wrote of my impending death. <laughs> it was a personal letter but being an unrepentant smart ass I printed it as a signed letter to the editor. <laughs> With a note at the end quoting Mark Twain, who said, under similar circumstances, reports of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Last month, I was drinking coffee in a local restaurant while two men were talking in a booth nearby. There's another man in my town, also named Mike Buffington. One of the guys at the restaurant was telling the other about the two Mike Buffingtons in town. Yep, he said, there's the good Mike Buffington, and there's the bad Mike Buffington. <laughs> I didn't turn around to ask him which was which. Depends where you are, well. We had a mayor in our town for eight years who was a frequent party in our editorial page. And he and I and our families had been friends before he got elected. But I ended up writing a lot of editorials opposing him. He became extremely bitter, and verbal attacks towards me in public were not uncommon. He finally retired a couple of years back. A few weeks ago, I ran into him at a high school track meet where his grandson was running. He came over, shook my hand, and we stood and talked for 30 minutes about our families and other things that old friends share. There was no trace of bitterness between us. The thread between these three anecdotes is this. Sometimes, as a weekly newspaper editor, 
We have to be an outspoken hard ass to do our jobs. We have to throw bricks through windows. And when we do, people are going to talk about us behind our backs in local restaurants. But if we're outspoken and fair in equal measure, many will come to understand that we're just doing our jobs with a passion for the truth. And sometimes, sometimes, even old adversaries will once again look at us as a human being. <laughs> we may not find love as weekly newspaper editors, but we can't earn respect. All of us in this room are fortunate to have the opportunity to do what we do, to see the world through a lens that few get a chance to look through. While others often see and experience the world narrowly, we get to see and write about the world broadly, with all of its crazy contradictions, its ugly beauty, its sad joyfulness, its poverty of wealth, and its hope of despair. Of these paradoxes, news is born. And when those we entrust as our leaders become corrupt or incompetent or abuse their power, we are the strongest voice and often the only voice in our towns calling for accountability and justice. Survey said that the essence of a good newspaper is the human spirit, not materialism. That spirit is alive in all of you. It's why you're here tonight. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of your chorus of voices, voices that seek to call things by their right name in towns all across the country and around the world. Thank you very much.